Welcome everyone. My name is Molly Dubin and I'm the curator with the Jewish Museum Milwaukee. And today uh, we are going to be exploring the topic of Jewish renewal and the rise of nationalism in Poland. Um, this program is being offered in connection with uh, the current JMM exhibit, The Girl in the Diary, Searching for Rivka in the Ludge Ghetto, which was originally developed by our friends at the Galicia uh, in Krakow. And I had an opportunity to see it there when it opened, which was actually when I had the opportunity to meet one of our speakers today. So with that, um, I'd like to say we are pleased and appreciative to have with us today, Jonathan Ornstein, who's the director of the JCC Krakow, and Neil Peace, Professor Emeritus of Polish History at UWM, who I've just learned is joining us from Wisconsin, but the Kettle Moraine region. <laughs> He's left Milwaukee for a little bit. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to our participants, our viewers for joining us today. So for our speakers and our audience following us virtually, I just wanted to lay out the format and then we'll get going. So uh, Jonathan is going to speak for about 20 minutes approximately on Jewish renewal. And then Neil is going to speak for approximately 20 minutes about the rise of nationalism in Poland. And then we're going to open it up to some Q&A and there's a chat function uh, for those of you who have participated or if not, it should be at the, the lower bar of your screen. And you can type in questions and when our presenters are done, I will field questions and direct them accordingly. So you can just, there you go. Cassie, my wonderful colleague, just showed you where you can type your questions. So, uh, and then we'll, we'll do a little wrap up at the end. So with that, why don't we get started? Uh, Jonathan, do you wanna take us away? Sure, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. I'm severely, severely disappointed that I'm not actually with you in Milwaukee. I was saying earlier, I was very much looking forward to this trip. A lot of friends uh, in Milwaukee, some are on the call who I see. I see my good friends, the Edelmans there, who are really part of our uh, Krakow, become part of our Krakow family here. Uh, but Milwaukee is a place uh, that, that I feel very connected to. And my wife uh, was supposed to come with me and she's never been. And I was saying a little earlier that she's an ice cream fanatic. And I, I was uh, looking forward for the last, for two years since I knew that the biennial was gonna, well, not called the biennial anymore, but whatever they call it, was gonna be in Milwaukee. I was excited to bring her to COPS. And then I found out from my friend Shari Shama, Rabbi Shama, that they opened, she knows I'm a pizza fanatic, that they opened Luminati's in Milwaukee. Yes. So I, I feel that, uh, you know, it might've been a, a one-way ticket to Milwaukee. I might've come and never, never left. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, but I'm happy, although the world has, uh, decided that we are spending our time this way. I'm happy to be here with you to be able to at least feel a little bit more connected, uh, connected to, to Milwaukee uh, than, than it would be. Although I'm a little worried about, I think that I'm happy that, that, uh, that I'm, I'm speaking first because after hearing about the rise of Polish nationalism, I might, be, I might get on a plane if there was one and uh, leave the country. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I live in my little naive bubble. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing hear what the prof professor piece uh, has to say. Terrific. So I'm going to tell, uh, you know, these days, uh, you know, we all, Jews are always a people of stories. And I think these days, more than ever, we need, uh, we need some good stories. So the rebirth of Jewish life, what's happening today in Poland, is a really good story. So I, I'm happy to, to, to talk about that and maybe start with a story, which I like, to, I like to tell, which to me is sort of the most dramatic illustration of what's happening uh, here in Krakow of this rebirth of Jewish life. So a few years ago, somebody walked into my building, into the JCC, back when people used to walk into buildings and buildings were <laughs> open. And uh, she's looking very nervous and wanted to speak to a rabbi. Uh, unfortunately, there was no rabbi around, it was only me. So they brought her up to my office and her name was Maria. And she sat down and uh, you know, I said, how, how can I help you? She said, well, I wanted to speak to somebody. I'm not sure I, uh, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing here. I said, no, just, just go ahead and let me know what's, what's on your mind. And she begins to tell me a story, which is a few days earlier, 
her grandmother called her over and said, come right over to my house. You got to come, come right over right away. And grandmother was at that point in her mid eighties. Everything okay, grandma? You're okay? Yes, yes, I'm fine. Just no questions, just come over. So Maria goes over to her grandmother's house, sees that the grandmother's okay, relaxes a little, says, you know, what, what's going on? She goes, listen, I have to tell you a story that I've never told anybody before. She says, I'm Jewish and you're Jewish. This is complete, absolute, no clue before, no idea before, never had any inkling, not sort of suspected, nothing. She tells, she's sitting, what, what are you talking about, Jewish? What, what, what do you mean? What, what are you talking about? And Maria, at this point, about 20, early 20s, says, well, I was, I'll tell you the story. I've never told a person, anybody. I was a little girl in the ghetto one day, and without any warning, my parents brought me to the edge of the ghetto, to the wall, handed me over to a couple who smuggled me through, uh, who then brought me over to uh, another couple who raised me as their own daughter. Um, and the last thing my mother said to me when she said goodbye, which was of course the final goodbye, her parents perished uh, during the Holocaust, never got out of the, or never left the ghetto to be free again. The last thing her mother said was never tell anyone that you're Jewish. Maria got, survived the war pretending to be the daughter of these people. They raised her as their own daughter, married, children, grandchildren, career. And until that day that she sat her eldest granddaughter down, had never told a single human being that she was Jewish. She told her that she's Jewish and Maria is sitting and then, then came, Googled the JCC, found, you know, Jewish Krakow and came into my office uh, because there was no rabbi. And is telling me this story and is look, looking at me, you know, with these eyes like saucers as she tells me the story. She finishes telling me and I'm thinking, oh my God, what a crazy story. But of course I can't relate to her that I, the stories to me, not unbelievable, but this, because this is, this is what I do. But there was a pretty amazing story to hear somebody who does fresh story, just a few days old. And I, she looked at me and, and I said, oh, okay, yeah, well, I hear stuff like that all the time, thinking like, oh my God, of course I don't hear stuff like that every day. But it tells me that, uh, I tell her that, you know, you've come to the right place and there are so many other young people who are also finding out they're Jewish just like, just like you. She calms down a little bit and uh, says, well, what do I do? And I say, well, come for, come for a Shabbat dinner. We have a Shabbat dinner here every week. And of course she looks at me and goes, What's a, what's a Shabbat dinner? Because how, how does she know what a Shabbat dinner is? She has no idea. So really, really, if I tell you, coming, from, coming in from the cold, really coming in from the cold. So she came for Shabbat dinner. She met some other people her age. She started to see that it wasn't, you know, what, what, it, what it all meant. It wasn't only these stories and ghosts, which is the general Polish collective consciousness idea of, of, of what being Jewish meant. She met some friends and she went on birthright, on taglit, and she... Uh, since then has rejoined the Jewish people and become an active member of our community. Uh, and that's, that story really encapsulates what's happening today in Krakow, or really what's happening today in Poland. Uh, but it's worth taking a minute and try to understand how we get to this point. How do we get in 2020, until two months ago, uh, until we closed uh, two months ago, to, that people were walking in this building having just found out in sometimes fantastic, unbelievable, dramatic ways like that, or sometimes even in banal ways like, um, you know, Googling your family and seeing that the name was changed a few generations ago, uh, or like my wife, whose sister got interested in her side of the family she didn't know about and did some genealogy uh, research and realized that they were, that they were Jewish, and my sis wife got dragged into a Hanukkah party at the JCC where we met, and uh, she became a lot more uh, involved Jewishly, let's say. So people in all different ways are, were finding out about that, but it's not, it's not self-evident how in 2020 people are finding out they're Jewish uh, in Poland. So it's worth taking a little jog through the history to see how we get to that point. Absolutely. Although I'll apologize, I'm not a historian, uh, so I won't, uh, don't, don't, don't hold me to any, uh, anything that I'm saying mm -hmm. um, through, the, through the lens of a historian. But Poland was a very Jewish place. This we know, all right? Sometimes we don't know how Jewish it was. It was 10% Jewish, right? It was three and a half million Jews before the war. 
We think of it often as just being in the shtetl and the smaller places being Jewish, but the cities were very Jewish. Warsaw was a third Jewish, Krakow was a quarter Jewish uh, leading up to World War II. 1939, uh, the, the Jews are a huge part of the middle class, big part of the cities in Poland, um, and Germany invades from one side, and if two weeks later, the Soviet Union invades from the other side, and you have World War II, and the Holocaust is perpetrated by the Nazis and their helpers all over Europe. And by the end of World War II, by the end of 1945, over 90% of Polish Jews have been murdered. Okay? Um, at this point, we understand there were survivors. We know they came to all our communities, to your community, to New York, where I'm from, to Israel, Canada, Australia. And usually, that's the end of the story when we think about Poland. We know there were a lot of Jews. We understand the tragic fate of what happened to those Jews during the war. They were murdered. The survivors were lucky enough to build, rebuild their lives in other countries. But not all the survivors left. Some of the survivors stayed in Poland after the Holocaust and during communism. Now, percentage-wise, it was, you know, most of the Jews were murdered, and it was a small percent that stayed. But still, you're starting with such a huge number that a small percent of three and a half million is still a significant amount of Jews. Now, during communism, there were ups and downs during communism. It wasn't very easy to be Jewish during communism, but it wasn't very easy to be anybody during communism. Certainly, the Jews suffered more uh, uh, during the, than the regular population. I think when you have systems like that and people aren't free, very often the minorities are the ones who feel, feel the brunt. So Jewish life limped on after the war, really until 1968. In 1968, uh, after the Six Day War and after the uh, student uprising started to begin around Europe and Poland included, the Jews were made a scapegoat for either supporting Israel and not being loyal Poles. And we should remember at this point that the Soviet Union was controlling Poland and the Soviet Union backed the Arab countries during the Six Day War. So certainly this idea of not being loyal to Poland and being a Zionist was, was something that they could play upon. And the Jews of Poland, and remember these Jews that had lived in Poland for up, up to a thousand years of Jewish history. We have documented Jewish history really since the 11th, 10th century in Poland. These Jews that had lived for such a long time had somehow survived the Holocaust that didn't leave Poland in the, uh, in the craziness after World War II and the chaos uh, were forced out of Poland in 1968. Uh, but again, not all the Jews. Some of the Jews were a stubborn people. Uh, Polish Jews, no, no less stubborn than Jews the rest of the world. And some of these Polish Jews stayed in Poland. But what did the Polish Jews who stayed in Poland do after 1968? They vanished into the woodwork. They went underground. They, to the, for the most part, changed their names and very often, again, speaking in generalities, there were obviously still a few that didn't, but for the most part, hid their identities and, uh, and stopped being openly Jewish. So the result of that was during the 70s and 80s, uh, for the last 20 years of communism, you really had almost no open Jewish life. There were a few older people here and there in a government controlled, uh, what the government allowed for Jewish life to be, but it was, it was a, a token, really a, a symbol of, of what was there before, and it in no way really represented the Jews who had gone underground and to pre pre prevent their families from uh, suffering anti-Semitism had changed their names and very often changed their identities. So today in Poland, you have very few people walking around with names like, you know, Schwartzberg and Cohen and and uh, you know, Le Le Levy and, and these very obvious Jewish names because most of them during communism changed their names. In 1989, when the system changed here, it happened very, very suddenly also for Poland. In other words, Poles yeah. hadn't been expecting that. It was a, a somewhat a, the same way that we were surprised on our side of the Iron Curtain. So, so were the Jews, so were the people of Eastern Europe. In 1989, Poland, Poland finds itself uh, a free country for the first time in a very long time, since 1939. And in this country, very much devoid of Jews with a, sh with a strong Jewish history, one of the things that the non-Jews have to come to terms with is the change in their country. The last time they were free, the country was 10% Jewish. The middle class was overwhelmingly Jewish. Now, 50 years later, 
They've survived the Holocaust. They've outlived, outlived communism. And there are no Jews around, really. So there starts to be a tremendous interest in all things Jewish among non-Jews. Jews start to write books. And Jews start to listen to klezmer music. And they start Jewish culture festivals, like the Jewish culture festival in Krakow, which is the world's largest Jewish culture festival started by two non-Jews right at the end of communism, still run by one of them, non-Jewish guy, 30 years later. So there starts to be this tremendous, tremendous amount of interest in all things Jewish, you know, in, in the sense of, I think, you know, people refer to it as some kind of phantom limb syndrome. The country was so Jewish, then the Jews were killed and forced out, and nobody really spoke about it during communism. So it's created this environment where these non-Jews are absolutely fascinated in everything Jewish. And that kind of sets the stage for where we are now, for what we're, what's going on with us now, which is a Jewish revival, which uh, means that our building, which has been open for 12 years, we just celebrated our 12th birthday, is, uh, ha was dedicated to uh, three ideas. One is reaching out to these young people uh, who are finding out that they're Jewish. Two, taking care of our Holocaust survivors. And we have over 50 survivors here in Krakow that now feel comfortable enough, feel safe enough to openly uh, be Jewish. And we're, we're taking care of them on a daily basis, dedicated space in the building. Uh, and the third is to let the world know that there's Jewish life once again in Poland. So our building is now open for 12 years, has now become really a meeting point, a hub, a center of this revival of Jewish life. And young people like Maria are walking in every day, uh, having just found out they're Jewish. And I think the interesting aspect is that they're acting upon it. So to find out you're Jewish is not enough. People today in France, uh, not to pick on France, which gets a lot of negative publicity from a Jewish perspective, but I think a decent amount of it is deserved. Uh, it's not a very safe place in many ways to be Jewish. And if you think about it, if you just found out about your Jewish identity today in Paris and you're 19 years old and you came to the big city to go to university and you're, uh, you, you have the option of doing something about it or not, I think the recent history in, in, in France and the situation for Jews in terms of anti-Semitism and in terms of safety is something that would probably uh, be a, pr prevent you uh, from, from the, or make it less likely for you to step forward and walk into a synagogue or walk into a JCC and say, here I am, I want to actively be Jewish. But because of this tremendous interest in all things, in Jew in all things Jewish among non-Jews, there's an environment here which in some ways makes up for, it doesn't erase the history and it doesn't overshadow the Holocaust or communism, but in some ways it, it takes a lot for somebody in Poland today to step forward and be Jewish, uh, considering the history, right? It's a, it's a difficult history. They, they're very aware of what happened to their own families in this place. So only because there's such a extreme interest uh, and acceptance of Jewish life today in Poland among the population. And I'm sure, you know, of course, there's anti-Semitism. There's a far right here. The government in many ways is not helpful and revisionist uh, history in terms of the Holocaust. Absolutely. But for the most part, the Polish population, more than many other places in the world, is very accepting of Jewish life, which is, and without that, we wouldn't have this revival, which we have. So what does that mean in terms of, for us as an institution, it means 750 Jewish members, uh, a few hundred of them uh, grew up without knowing they were Jewish and really only became Jewish by coming through our, our doors. It means a preschool, the first Jewish preschool to open, community preschool to open in Krakow since the Holocaust. That is full, closed now, but we're, we're starting to reopen that, uh, full of Jewish kids. And that's as a response to people, uh, young Jews who meet each other. Now they have a place to meet, that they have come out of the woodwork, come out of the closet as Jews and are meeting each other and starting Jewish families. So we've opened a preschool in response to that. We have BBYO run through our building, Hillel run through our building, uh, Shabbat dinners every week, uh, uh, hundreds of people studying Hebrew and Yiddish and people taking Arabic and the center really being becoming once again a, a focal point of Jewish life and also 
a, uh, a, the third part of our mission, I mentioned survivors and, and uh, the young people finding out they're Jewish, is a visitor center. So that we need, for us, we, we think it's important for the world to understand what's happening today in Poland. And to those ends, we have become a Jewish visitor center and welcomed about 140,000 or so visitors uh, through our building in 2019. So I think this idea of the rebirth of Jewish life, one, it's important for these people. These are Jews who are lost, and we have a responsibility to welcome our lost family members in, no matter where that is. Uh, if it's Ethiopians that we need to bring to Israel to help them reconnect to their Jewish background, whether it's Poles that we need to uh, you know, show, show them here in our JCC what it means to be Jewish and what our history is and what Hebrew is and learn about Israel and kosher cooking and all of that. Um, you know, it's important to do that anywhere. So, um, uh, but, but the added value, I think, of doing that in a place like Poland and the message that it, it sends to the rest of the Jewish world that in the place of the Holocaust, in a place where so much tragedy has befallen our people, Jewish life is able to thrive again. I think it's an incredibly um, important, optimistic message. Uh, and people, our visitors, these people who come here uh, either to visit us during the year, they come to do our bicycle ride. We do something called Ride for the Living, which is one of our signature events, which is a bicycle ride from Auschwitz uh, to the JCC to show the resilience of our community and to raise money to be able to, to keep serving our community. People that come here find, uh, first they're surprised to find such uh, vibrant Jewish life, but I think it makes them, it really makes them examine their own Jewish identity. They think, wait a minute, you know, at a time of increased anti-Semitism around the world, when we, were, we thought that these lessons of the Holocaust that had been learned uh, haven't been learned and a resurgent, you know, neo-Nazis around the world and, and, you know, even at extreme far right in the United States and, and these things that we, synagogue shootings and attacks, things that we thought were belong to the past don't actually belong to the past. And this idea of a community that is in just about the last place that you would expect any type of revival to go on, to be ongoing, a uh, place that was first of all the Holocaust, center of the Holocaust, and then almost 50 years of, of uh, communism is, is I think it reminds us of, of, of our, the sort of the eternal nature of the Jewish people. If Jewish life can thrive in Poland and thrive in Krakow and an hours drive from Auschwitz, then I think that no Jewish community ever is really written off. And I think that's, that's really the, the importance, not only for our community, it's important for our community because these are human beings. And every one of them that we bring into the Jewish world, bring back to the Jewish world is, is important. But on a larger scale, what we're doing here, this experiment of rebuilding Jewish life, Jews and non-Jews working together to rebuild Jewish life, I think has historical importance considering the importance of Poland in the history of the Jewish world. This is the place where the Jewish people in many ways in the diaspora became the Jewish people, but also because of the trauma of the Holocaust. And if we can re rebuild, organically rebuild Jewish life in a place, the epicenter of the Holocaust, then I think it reminds us of all the better, the better nature of, of, of the better aspects of being Jewish. And maybe, you know, can even help young people who feel an increase of anti-Semitism who go to Jewish schools that are that there that there's guards and and you know plenty of security around stuff that we didn't people my age didn't grow up with it reminds of, of you know reminds them that you know this too shall pass. Yeah. So, I think that's fantastic, Jonathan. Um, thank you so much for kind of laying the table and for giving us a, a brief history, kind of leading up to where we are today and the incredibly important initiatives that you are spearheading in many ways from the JCC Krakow, all the incredible programming. Um, I think it's a good jumping off point and transition uh, over to Neil, particularly one of the end things that you talked about there. You have so many young people who are coming that have found out, just found out that they are Jewish. Um, they want to know more. They want to explore that. They want to embrace it. Um, and at a time when there's a rise of nationalism and you're seeing, you know, the, the anti-Semitism, you're, you're kind of revisiting some of the trauma from decades ago it is now rearing its, its ugly head again, um, which could be challenging for, for a, a huge initiative of renewal. So with that, I'd like to segue over to Neil 
who is going to talk to us about that rise of nationalism and, and what we're seeing today. Neil? Sure, hi, thanks. Um, first of all, thank you, Jonathan, for that, uh, for that uh, very good presentation. I, I'm, it's an honor for me to uh, be able to share this platform with you. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I actually know Kajimiash area pretty well. Um, been there for the uh, cultural festival a couple of summers. Generally stay just a few a uh, few doors down from JCC and uh, have, have been to JCC several times for presentations and the like. Just one, one correction, if I may, I think I was introduced as a professor emeritus. Uh, I'm not there yet. And just in case my students wouldn't think that they don't have to turn in their papers uh, for this semester, uh, no, the, the due date is still next week. Um, Apologies, Neil. Apologies. That's okay. Thank that's you. okay. <laughs> yeah. um, my, first of all, I agree with pretty much everything Jonathan has said, and uh, I don't want to repeat too much of, of, of what he's laid out for us. My general assignment is to talk about the rise of nationalism in Poland and just a warning, when European historians like me hear the word nationalism, uh, we start to salivate. And there's the temptation to go into sort of intricate detail about what nationalism is and what its historical importance and so on and so forth. I'm going to try to avoid that, but just to remind us that nationalism is an attitude, right? It's, 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 it's this feeling of kinship with and obligation to a people of which one is a part and, and you're a part of it because of certain shared cultural characteristics or attitudes or shared history, uh, mutual sense of obligation. And in the modern period, this has led to the rise of the idea of specific national homelands uh, intended to provide a, a, a shelter for uh, a particular nation or group. Now in the Polish case, uh, nationalism has come up because, you know, up until a few years ago, po Poland was considered the poster child for a successful transition from communism to a vibrant democracy, free market economy, a uh, member of the world community like that. In, in recent years, we've, we've heard more about Poland as the place where nationalism is on the rise, populist politics on the rise, the appearance of far right groups, and uh, you know, generally in a negative or threatening sort of sort sort of context, um, I've decided that that for purposes of simplification, probably the best thing I can do is what I want to talk about is what is going on in Polish politics today. How is it? fed by this recent rise in nationalism and how do you explain that? And what does this have to do with Jewish matters? And apologies if I've got to go back and establish some sort of historical context. You know, there's a truism in Polish stuff that if you're going to try to explain something that's happening today, you necessarily have to start by saying, well, you got to go back to the 16th century. I'm not going to go that far back, but, but, you know, we should remember that for a long time, before the 18th and 19th century, Poland existed as one of the largest and most important countries in Europe, and it was wildly multi-ethnic, multicultural. And of course, this Poland was wiped off the map of Europe by a series of partitions in the late 18th century. And you did not have the return of Polish statehood until the early 20th century. During the 19th century, about the time that modern nationalism was beginning to form among the peoples of Europe, you had what developed as a, a running argument over the question, what does it mean to be Polish? 
how do you define Polishness? And broadly speaking, what you had was the appearance of two different ideas of Polishness and what it meant to be a part of the Polish nation. And one of these was sort of, if we can call it multicultural or multi-ethnic, that is a sort of idea of Polishness that wasn't limited to what we might call ethnic Poles alone. A sort of idealized vision of what the old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been like, where you had Polish speakers coexisting with people we would now classify as Ukrainians or Lithuanians or Germans, or Yiddish-speaking Jews, what have you. Uh, and you know, this sort of open definition of Polishness continued, in a sense, into the 20th century. But more and more in the 19th century, it was challenged by a more specifically, narrowly, ethnically, quote unquote, Polish idea of nationhood. That is, to be Polish, you had to be a Slav, whose mother language was Polish. You were almost certainly Roman Catholic by religious persuasion or, 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 or background. And this sort of paralleled the rise of ethnically based nationalisms elsewhere in Eastern Europe, among Ukrainians, Lithuanians, so on, so forth. Um, and this continued into the 20th century. And the implications of these two different, if you will, conceptions of Polish nationhood have obvious implications for those who would classify as non-Poles. Uh, you know, the, the more open definition said that, well, there could be a place for people of Ukrainian or Jewish, what have you, background within a Poland. They could be full citizens. Uh, they could be considered just as Polish as sort of ethnic Poles themselves, almost in a sense, not to draw too close a comparison to the sort of American idea of uh, nationality, right? That it's not simply open to Anglo-Saxons, that you could be Italian, Irish, uh, African-American, whatever. And as long as you had allegiance to, 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 to the ideals of the United States, then you could be just as much a member of the American nation. On the other hand, this more ethnically based nationalism tended to exclude, right? Uh, you could only be Polish and fully a member of a Polish nation or by extension a Polish state if you were an ethnic Pole. Now, uh, World War II seemed to end that argument. Uh, because of the traumatic experience, uh, because of the war damage, uh, because of the genocide that was carried out, uh, because of the communist takeover. Afterwards, it was followed by the half century of the Polish People's Republic uh, or, or Communist Poland. Now, ironically, in a sense, uh, World War II and the Soviet takeover created, in a sort of deeply ironic sense, something like the ideal vision of uh, the Poland that had been posited by pre-war right-wing nationalism. That is because you had genocide, you had the uh, annihilation of the Jews, you had uh, forced population transfers and ethnic cleansings, you had a redefinition of the boundaries at um, uh, the insistence of the Soviet Union. What you created was a Poland made up of almost nothing but ethnic Poles, uh, a country that went from about being two thirds ethnically Polish to almost 100%. Now, uh, during the PRL period, during the communist period, it was almost as if normal politics was suspended, right? Uh, because the big issue was the communist government itself. And what you had 
was sort of a banding together of all sorts of elements from what might have been defined as the political left, the political right, nationalists, Catholics, ex-Marxists, what have you. And in a sense, they joined together in a broad coalition to oppose the communist government. And that held until 1989 with the downfall of the dictatorship. Uh, now, since 1989, the date that is set as the end of communism and the beginnings of the Third Polish Republic, what feeds the current form of Polish nationalism that in a sense derives a lot of its energy from that earlier argument that to be Polish, you needed to be ethnically Polish in this sort of more narrow sense. Uh, well, um, it comes down to several issues that have become arguments in Polish culture and Polish politics um, since the downfall of communism. Number one, one argument is over what actually happened in 1989. For, about, for roughly the past 20 years, political life in Poland has been divided between two camps. One of them you might call representing the political right, another the political center, that both came out of the solidarity movement of the 1980s, but increasingly have divided uh, over various issues. One of them, what happened in 1989? Was it a genuine transition from communism to democracy? Or was it flawed, incomplete, maybe even a sort of corrupt bargain between some compromised elements of solidarity and the communist regime? In other words, uh, did you not quite get fully rid of, uh, of, of, of communist influence uh, during the first 20 years or so of post-communism? Uh, there was also, in a sense, a division in Polish society between those who were winners from the downfall of communism and those who were losers. The transition to democracy tended to benefit those in Poland who were younger, better educated, more urban. They managed to uh, survive and thrive in this new open society. But what you had was about half the population that saw itself as having not benefited from the transition generally older, more rural, less educated, uh, perhaps more traditionally religious, uh, Catholic, uh, than, than those younger uh, elements who, who, who managed to gain from the transition. There was an argument over how much Poland wanted to become, quote unquote, a part of Europe. Poland joined NATO, Poland joined the EU, but you had a division between Poles who said, yes, we want to become more like Western Europe. We want to be fully members of the EU, but then you had lots of Poles who adopted, if you, shall, if you will, a sort of Euroskeptical attitude, uh, something like you find in other European countries. Um, is this actually what we want? Do we want to become more like France or Germany? or uh, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, does this sort of identification with Europe mean identification with a structure that is, say, hostile to traditional Polish national values? Uh, is it hostile to, uh, to Polish religiosity? 
is it asking us to, to, to give up elements of our specific national heritage and culture? Uh, last but not least, there is a division over the question, what happened during the war, World War II? And differing attitudes or approaches to what happened to Poland during the war. How should we remember what happened during the war? How concerned should we be over how the outside world sees the Polish role in World War II and the Holocaust? To a certain extent, this ties in with, with Jonathan's point about the new interest in things Jewish and the Jewish heritage of Poland seemed to be uh, wiped out after the Second World War. And, and, and Poles, particularly a younger generation, wanting to remember and revive and recapture this. Well, you did have this upsurge of interest in Jewish matters and also among Polish historians. Uh, you know, in many ways, looking at the Holocaust, looking at Jewish matters, looking at World War II in anything but a sort of mythic portrayal of Poland as a nation that had been heroic and victimized during the war, that was taboo. You didn't do that. It was discouraged by the communist government. Um, but, but, but then after, after the end of communism, uh, you had this sort of reevaluation of the war. You had historians looking at the records of the war and what they found in many cases, well, you know, you know it, 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 it's sometimes the duty of historians to, to, to poke holes in pious myths and, and, and what these historians found was a record that didn't overturn entirely that idea of Polish heroism and victimhood. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a large element of truth in that, but also found that there were lots of elements of ambiguity and uh, new issues raising questions about the degree of the complicity of individual Poles in uh, anti-Jewish atrocities during the Holocaust. Uh, on the other hand, you had people who favored this sort of reevaluation of, 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 of the Polish historical record, but then also a sort of defensive reaction against that you know, for reasons that are probably understandable. You know, it, it seemed to challenge uh, cherished ideas of uh, Polish patriotism and, 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 and the like. And so what you have had since 2015 with the installation of this current government uh, that, that is generally characterized as rightist and nationalist is a government that in a sense has set itself up as the defender of those sides of those long arguments that in a sense would incline toward the nationalist view. That they are the government that is going to complete uncompleted transition from communism. They are going to serve as the champions of those who were left behind by the transition to post-communism. They were going to adopt a Euro-skeptical approach to that, how much do we want to be like Europe argument. And they were going to defend the Polish historical record concerning the Second World War, and particular uh, the question of Polish, if you want to call it culpability, uh, 
re regarding Jewish matters uh, during World War II. Now, for what it's worth, it's still important to note that uh, Poland is a functioning democracy, freedom of speech, things like that. Uh, whether our listeners will find this uh, 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 comforting or not, uh, Freedom House says that Poland is nowadays uh, every bit as much a, 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 a working democracy as the United States of America. Uh, now, how much time do I got left? Well, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're wanting to segue into our okay. Q&A here. So. Okay. Let me, save us. Let, uh, let me just say a couple of words. What does all this have to do with Jews and Jewish matters? Something, not everything. Uh, you do find in Poland, you can, you, you can find them easily enough, uh, open or tacit anti-Semitic language by far-rightist groups. These far-rightist groups uh, should be distinguished from the current government. Uh, they do exist. Uh, they make a lot of noise. Uh, they get headlines. Uh, it's not clear that they have anything like more than minimal uh, overall public support. Uh, you, you also find anti-Semitic language used in statements by, let's call them, unreconstructed elements in the Polish Catholic Church. You do find rising incidents of acceptance of anti-Semitic attitudes in Poland in public opinion polls, as you do elsewhere in Europe, let's point out. Um, but on the other hand, um, you find demonstrations of, you know, anti-Jewish, oh, you know, burning of effigies, uh, graffiti, incidents, uh, vandalism of cemeteries, that sort of thing, uh, but nothing like the um, uh, physical attacks or lethal attacks that you find in certain countries of Western Europe. Uh, so Neil, if it's, yeah. if it's okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you, kind okay. of thought yep. there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do want to, I know we have several questions and I, gotcha. I want to give us some time uh, for that. And I actually just wanted to kick off with the first question, which really kind of speaks to some of the things you're, you're speaking about here, which um, this idea of a revisionist history, this idea of, uh, you know, the question of the complicity of, of the Polish people. Um, yeah. And I guess I'd like to pose my first question this question to Jonathan um, with this rise that we're seeing in nationalism and things like we saw uh, a few years ago with the, you know, the Holocaust law, um, which is a part of that, you know, revisionist vision. Um, Jonathan, do you, do you see this rise as, um, you know, as, as presenting some unique challenges to your initiatives and have you seen people who are wanting to come out of the woodwork, as you kind of talked about earlier, to uh, explore their Judaism? Is there some reticence there? Um, I guess, so, so can you talk to us about what are some of the unique challenges in, in terms of a renewal amid a rise in nationalism? Whoop. Unmute. My there goodness. we go. The cardinal sin of not, not unmuting oneself. Uh, yeah, no, I, I very much uh, appreciated what, uh, what Neil said because if, overall, but people are always so curious. Jews are always so curious about Polish anti Semitism. You know, if you say I'm going to Poland, that's the first question. If you say I'm going to France, they might say, oh, have, you know, make sure to bring back wine or make sure to eat in this place. It's not the first thing that everybody associates with just about any other country, but Poland it is. And it's always complicated to explain, especially these days in terms of this government. Um, and I think that this government, it, it, what their actions, although sometimes I find them, again, speaking as a Jew, not as a Polish citizen, which I also am, I very much against, I don't wanna say everything they do, but a lot of what they do, but as a Jew, um, a lot of what they do make, uh, is, 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 is troubling in terms of history and the Holocaust, but I don't think it comes from a place of anti-Semitism. 
I think, I think that th this idea that Poles have been taught for a very long time to see themselves as heroes and victims. And after communism, when they were just kind of starting to come to terms with this more nuanced view of themselves that yes, they were victims during the war, but they also did some things to the Jews. And this government is just sort of selling, you know, it's like giving candy to, to, to a baby. It's a, you know, it's a very easy sell to say, we don't have anything to apologize for. Poles were all heroes, uh, you know, this, so it's not anti-Semitism in the sense, they're not saying we don't care what happened to the Jews. They're saying we very much care what happened to the Jews, we saved them, and they just don't want to talk about the times when, unfortunately, that wasn't always the case, and sometimes Poles, Poles saved Jews, and sometimes they turned them in or killed them. So it's a very interesting idea that it's sort of this nationalism that is wed to this idea of only seeing themselves in this positive light, which the result is that it's denying us our own history, right? Which we are very, especially fluent in that type of language of denying people their own history and stuff. In Poland, again, you have a very, you have a very homogenous society. So there aren't really people saying, wait a minute, that's in, in great numbers saying, wait a minute, that's not fair, that's not this, because the majority of people are Polish Catholic. Uh, so in terms of though, how it causes issues for us on the ground, it doesn't really cause problems in the day to day. Now, there could be some young person who sees the governments and listens to the government's rhetoric and therefore doesn't walk into our building and doesn't become another one of these stories that I tell people. And I'll never know about that. But I do, I am in touch with people and my wife herself found out she was Jewish. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I have my finger on the pulse of that. And I don't think it's really stopping things. I think the problem that it causes is that for the Polish Jewish community to succeed moving forward, we need to be reconnected to the Jewish world. And a lot of the heavy, lift, heavy lifting that people like me and others have done to reconnect Poland, Jewish Poland to the Jewish world is undone when, they, when the Jewish world is looking for anti-Semitism and it's easy to find by saying, aha, you're not allowed to talk about the Holocaust in Poland. Aha, look what this government did about reparations uh, and things and, and restitution and things like that. So it's less of an issue on the ground with this government and it is more because it kind of poisons a world that's already predisposed to seeing anti-Semitism in Poland. And at the same time that I disagree with what the government's doing, I don't think it's coming from a place of anti-Semitism as much as from a place of just, it's an easy sell to people to, te to, to tell the populace that they don't have to be apologetic for things that, they, that their ancestors did during the war. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you very much. So um, we do have several questions that have come in via the chat. So if it's okay, I'm going to uh, read and direct a few of these and uh, I will preface it by saying uh, a number of them are, are directed to Jonathan. So um, let's start with uh, the question of, do you see a difference in attitude from local community towards Jews versus Israelis? Local non-Jewish community, I suppose. Yes. Uh, it's interesting, you know, I, I, you know, I find myself, when I speak to Poles, I'm very critical. When I speak to Jews, I find myself, you know, I'm sort of the other way. But, you know, Poland and Israel have very good relationship. Israel, uh, along with the Czech Republic, I think has been the best friend of Poland, uh, a best, uh, best friend of Israel in the, in the EU. Uh, sometimes it's a bumpy relationship there, here and there. We have issues like with the IPN law, with the Holocaust bill a few years ago. But, you know, you have tourism year on year, not counting this corona situation, up 50% year on year from 2018 to 19, 19 to 20. So you have a massive amount of Israelis coming to Poland, a huge amount of Poles going to Israel. They're a very warm relation. So I, a lot of the anti-Israel sentiment that you find in Europe, especially Western Europe, you don't really find it here. We don't have to have extra security when we do Israeli events. You're an Israeli professor giving a talk. You don't have, we don't have these, all the issues and people throwing fake, you know, red paint and doing all of these issues that we're dealing with in the United States and Western Europe, we don't really deal with. So it's not as if, oh, they accept local Jews, but they don't like Israel. They like Israel too. And they like Israelis. And I think there are two reasons for that. One, Israel is a country, uh, a, a, a country that's an underdog surrounded by uh, tough neighbors. And Poland sees, Poland sees itself that way. Remember that Poland is with Germany on one side and Russia on the other, which is historically where you don't want to be in, in Europe. And also, it, Poland has 
long memory of Jews living here. Jews were the, you know, Jews were the the uh, the academics and the traders and the business people and the the merchants and they weren't these, you know, they weren't the, really these aggressive warrior types. So the idea that suddenly Polish Jews move to Israel and become this like bloodthirsty people that want to kill all the Arabs, it doesn't sit well in the Polish mentality because they they feel like wait, we know these are our Jews. We know we know what they're like, and that it doesn't. The BBC version of, of Israel doesn't play well in Poland. So I think for those reasons, you have a country, really Poland and Israel, very strong, very warm relations. Terrific, thank you. So a um, couple of other and questions uh, that I'm going to feel to Jonathan. Um, I'm going to combine these two. Um, one is the question of do we see rebirth or Jewish renewal happening in other cities in Poland? Um, and then kind of a follow-up question uh, from someone else. How many, approximately how many Jews are in Krakow today? Uh, number of synagogues, you know, the level of religiosity in terms of those synagogues. Um, so a few statistics there, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. So you see this rebirth happening in other large cities in Poland, in Warsaw, uh, in uh, Wrocław, I think, are the main two. I would say there's some Jewish life in Łódź, but it's more of kind of a kind of more like neo-Hasidic, it's very strange, Gdansk, but the main centers of Jewish life, the place that I would say 15, 20 years from now, you have a decent chance to have Jewish, vibrant Jewish communities are Warsaw, Krakow, and Wrocław, which used to be Breslau, which is in the southwest uh, of the country, which used to be German, German before the war and then given to Poland after the borders, uh, after the borders move. Krakow is very special, I think, because of the numbers of tourists that come through here, because we're down the road from Auschwitz, and because we have the best preserved Jewish quarter anywhere in Europe is, is, is Kazimierz, the Jewish quarter where we have seven renovated pre-war synagogues. Two of them are used. Um, in terms of the number of Jews today in, 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 in Krakow, I would say you have uh, a little more than a thousand self-identifying probably 3,000 if you had perfect, you could look at everybody and see who has a Jewish grandparent or not, probably uh, at least three, 4,000 today in Krakow. The city is about 750,000 uh, population, 800,000. We have 750 Jewish members at the JCC. Um, in terms of what type of life there is, there's a generally Orthodox uh, Jewish life and we've start, recently started a reform uh, community. Uh, in, in, in Krakow as well. So you have Orthodox and, uh, and a bit of reform. Ch Chabad, modern Orthodox, and reform. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think this is really, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it up to both of you, but I, I think this is maybe something Neil can start off speaking to. Um, we've seen from the Catholic Church um, some apologies in recent years in far, as far as um, not speaking up or, um, you know, looking at their role. So the question is, um, what role does the Catholic Church have when we're kind of talking about looking at this more recent role in nationalism um, as far as complicity in the Holocaust and, and their stance there? Uh well, there's a couple of issues here. One, one, one is the larger one, uh, which is not specifically Polish, which has to do with uh, what was the record of the Catholic Church and specifically the wartime Pope, Pius XII, uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, th that, that's in many ways a whole separate issue. Uh, and, 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 and I'll leave that alone. That's something that's still being sifted out by, by, by historians. Uh, Poland is, of course, um, historically and now overwhelmingly Catholic. It's one of the most Catholic cultures uh, in, in the world. Um, and the church has played a, a, a large role in Polish affairs uh, in the 20th century. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the Catholic Church in Poland had a, a great deal to do with the liberation from communism. Uh, one has only to remember the role of uh, Polish Pope, John Paul II. Uh, as far as the role of the church regarding Jewish questions or historical revisionism, that, that's, that's complicated. It's easy for historians to say, well, it's complicated, but it's complicated. Uh, there is no 
one Catholic attitude uh, that one can point to, one finds, on the whole, remember that there has been a sea change in Catholic relations or attitudes towards Jews and Judaism as a whole in the 20th century, uh, particularly since the Second Vatican Council and uh, of the 1960s, and this has been reflected in Poland as, as well. On the other hand, uh, generally speaking, uh, the, the Catholics, strong Catholics, are considered a core element of the supporters of the current Polish government. Uh, there are many people who say that the church in Poland as a whole has gotten too aligned with the current government, uh, become, become partisan. Uh, and uh, it is more or less notorious that uh, some Catholic outlets, uh, Radio Maria is the one that one hears about most, uh, it, it, it is one of the main outlets for what, what I don't know if you might call it, uh, neo-anti-Semitic attitudes. Uh, you know, in, in the press, broadcast, things like that. I don't know if Jonathan wants to add anything to that. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I would agree completely with what you said. I would say that uh, a few other things I would add that, one, I would say that the relations with Jews and Catholics or the Catholic Church has probably never been better. Now, you can read into that. You can look at that in a few different ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but we feel that we have not only a tolerance from the Catholic Church, from the mainstream Catholic Church, excluding the far right elements of the Catholic Church, Radio Maria and stuff, um, but we feel we have a warm partnership with the Catholic Church in, in Poland. That's not only in Krakow, that would, what uh, Rabbi Shudrick, the chief rabbi of Poland, does a ton of interfaith stuff. We do a lot of interfaith uh, here. If uh, there was a situation where there was graffiti a few years ago on the monument on the right before in the ghetto uh, before we were uh, sorry in Płaszów in the camp in Krakow and we do a march every year from the ghetto uh, to to Płaszów march of remembrance and the cardinal marched with us um, so we, we feel that it's a really a positive situation you're right to of course mention John Paul II who's really like the Mandela of Poland. And the fact that he's, you know, all that, that he did to fight against anti-Semitism and the fact that he's from Krakow still, you know, here in this, in this city makes, makes a big difference. But uh, I think Poland, to be honest, looking at Polish anti-Semitism from, a, you know, taking a 30,000 foot view, I think Poles are generally more xenophobic than they are anti-Semitic. And when Jews were the other, they, they, you know, they were kind of anti-Semitic. But I think that, you know, a lot of that sentiment has been transferred to more to refugees and Muslims. So the Catholic, you know, someone who's far right here, there aren't really that many Jews around. So what is there to be against? But the threat, the threat of the other, is not really the Jews as much as, as, much as refugees and Muslim refugees, especially. Uh, where you see that playing in terms of the Jews is in terms of property and restitution. The Jews are coming back and taking all their property and things like that. But to be honest, you know, when I, the, the, the Catholic Church today, the mainstream Catholic Church today, is a really a partner in this Jewish rebirth. Now, if the numbers were 10 times higher and tens of thousands of Poles were leaving the church and becoming Jewish, maybe they wouldn't be so thrilled, but we're not there yet. So I, I think we're, uh, we're okay. Great, thank you for weighing in on that, Jonathan. So, um, I think that we are going to uh, kind of head into a wrap up here. There, there, uh, there's, there's a comment that has to do with the comparison of democracy in the U.S. to rising nationalism and and the revenge of those who were left behind. So, uh, kind of lead, leading into our wrap up with that. Um, Maybe you could uh, start us off, Neil, just with a little, just a, a brief, what you see as in the very near future, what, what you see on the horizon in terms of this wave of nationalism. Speaking about Poland or uh, Europe 
Western world in general? Uh, more, more to Poland in, in okay. general, more to Poland specifically, excuse me. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> hard enough for uh, historians to keep track of the, to keep track of the past. Uh, asking us to predict the future is very hazardous, if only because uh, we tend to be largely influenced by what happened in the past and see that as a guide to what's going to happen in the future. Uh, right now, my best guess would be that this sort of ongoing dispute in Poland over what does it mean to be Polish? Um, how, how does one interpret Polish history in general and the more recent history since World War II? Uh, that's that's going to go on. Um, do I think that Polish democracy is in danger? I mean, not, not as an immediate prospect. I mean, uh, Poland is, you know, sometimes you see Poland thrown into a bag, uh, comparing it with Hungary, let's say, where the drift towards something like autocracy is a lot further advanced than, than, it, than it is in Poland. Uh, now, that being said, not, 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 not to sound alarmist, but if 20 years down the line, we are looking at a bad result in Poland. We would be able to look back and say, well, you know, we might have been able to see it coming, you know, this or that. I don't think we're here now. Uh, I think the odds are good that Polish democracy uh, and civil society will will continue. That. Uh, uh, the, the, the current interest in, in uh, the Jewish revival, let's call it, uh, will, will continue. I think there's very good grounds for that. I think particularly if you look at uh, the younger generation of Poles, uh, many of whom seem to have uh, uh, a sort of welcoming attitude towards uh, reviving what they see as the most generous of Polish national traditions. Uh, I, I think the odds are probably in favor of, uh, of that side. Okay, thank you very much, Neil. So uh, before, Jonathan, do you, do you have uh, any reflections on what Neil just said? And then I'll kind of pose my last question to you. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I agree with Neil. I think that Poland, Pol this Polish government would like would like to uh, have a situation like Hungary, uh, but they've pushed the bounds. And I see, I think they understand that Polish society. There's a stronger civil civil society in Poland that is not g allowing them to kind of push it as far in the direction of Hungary as they would like to. So they sort of make these statements and they move in that direction, and then Polish society kind of kind of stops them. But that's that's what they would like to do. Make no mistake that they, when they look at when they look at Europe, the, this ruling party would, looks to Hungary as their as their role model. I just don't think that they'll be able to get there. Okay, thank you. And kind of my last question, because I I think it would be nice to. Uh, you know, certainly in light of all the difficult history we've discussed and, and the challenges that we as a global society are in today. Um, Jonathan, what are, are some of the, the great things that you envision or, or the positive trends that you see continuing in terms of the initiative for Jewish renewal and what you specifically are doing at uh, JCC Krakow? Well, I mean, I hope that when we come out of this, that, you know, depending on what the world looks like, we are, as an institution, uh, are very dependent on overseas funding. We raise over 90% of our budget overseas. So uh, depending what the Jewish philanthropic world looks like as we start to come out of Corona, that will, that will dictate a lot about what we can, what we are able to do. Um, I mentioned the preschool. We need to continue to develop that. We've reached capacity. We need to figure a way for that to grow. We're doing all we can to develop our BBYO and Hillel programs that, uh, that are run through our JCC, actually. Uh, so I think just this idea of continue to build the infrastructure to continue to, continue to get 
these people that have Jewish roots, get them involved and to show them that they have a place in the Jewish world and be able to run programming and, 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 and that we've been doing and, and to continue to expand that is really the, the big challenge. And I, I, if you would have asked me three months ago, I would have said everything is moving along well. It's a difficult to be able to, to, what we're doing is difficult, but we're managing. But now it's really a great unknown as there's a lot, you know, as this, you know, a lot of what we're doing is really tied to sort of this larger idea of the philanthropic landscape. And as there's greater need in local communities, then how much of uh, people, especially American Jewry, uh, looks, looks outward will, will dictate a lot of what we're able to do. But, you know, all the pieces are there. You have a Polish population that's, uh, you know, as Neil said, the young people are really eager to help us help, uh, help explore this Jewish rebirth and help us as, as, our, as our active partners. And I think looking back, it would be a shame if we had this ability to revive a Jewish community and we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do it. So we're gonna give it, we're gonna continue giving it all we can. That's terrific. Thank you so much. So um, we're gonna just wrap it up. I just wanna segue. Um, Jonathan, of course, uh, spoke about the support that is needed for uh, JCC Krakow and the Jewish Renewal Initiative to continue doing their important work. So if you'd like to support them, we encourage you to visit their website and certainly we can put you in touch with uh, Jonathan or, or follow up with information if you'd like it. Uh, and also on that same note, I'd like to uh, say that, of course, today is Giving Tuesday. We, we all are very much aware of that. So um, if you enjoyed this program, um, if you're enjoying the slate of virtual programming that uh, the Jewish Museum Milwaukee is presenting that we hope to continue, to present, uh, we encourage you to donate because every little bit helps us to continue to offer the programming and important content and to continue to do the work that we are doing. So we thank you all for being here. Thank you so much to Jonathan. Thank you to Neil. Thank you to all of our participants for their wonderful questions and comments. Uh, and we will hope to see you all again soon for some upcoming virtual content. Thanks. Thank you again, Jonathan and Neil. Everyone have a wonderful day. Stay healthy and safe.